give some evidence that the moon is uh well not all it's cut out to be yeah um it's not a hollow sound uh what what happened is that um uh in apollo 12 and in apollo 13 there were uh basically objects that were impacted against the moon um and there was a pre-positioned seismometer which returned signatures that indicated that the moon was largely hollow. Right. So, so in the first case, uh, in the first case, what was the date here? Um, yeah, I 19 here. November, November of 1969. So in November of 1969, uh, Apollo 12's lander crashed into the surface of the moon and a pre-positioned seismometer uh, registered reverberations for about an hour. And then once uh, this, to say the least, raised eyebrows at NASA, they deliberately repeated this as a, as a formal test in Apollo 13, uh, where they crashed the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle into the moon. And... Uh, this object, which weighed 15 tons, um, it caused the moon to uh, basically ring for three hours, to ring like a hollow bell for three hours. This was April 14th, 1970. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, a number of scientists have comment commented on this, including, by the way, of all people, Carl Sagan, before he became such a staunch skeptic. You know, Sagan's early work was interesting. He wrote a, an early book on extraterrestrial intelligence with a Russian scientist. And he was a little more forthcoming in his early days. And he commented on this and said, well, this is frightening because a natural moon cannot be hollow that way. And uh, so this is one of the telltale signs that we're dealing with an artificial space station. But there are a number of others that are, frankly, um, equally disturbing. And one is that on the moon, no matter how wide the craters are, they're always only a certain depth, mm -hmm. right? So you would expect, like on Earth, if asteroid impacts or meteorites, whatever, are going to cause a crater to form, that the crater would be proportionally as deep as it is wide. And moreover, you'd expect the crater basin to be con uh, cave, but on the moon, you have only convex crater basins, which are all the more apparently convex, the wider the basin is, right? Mm -hmm. And these basins are all shallow. So just so I make sure I don't get this number wrong, I think it was something like, like, yeah, okay, let me, let me give you some of these numbers because the devil's in the details here and the numbers are really actually quite astonishing. So you have, um, None of these craters are more than five or six miles deep. So, for example, the Gagarin crater, the crater named after Yuri Gagarin, is 186 miles across, but less than four miles deep. Mm -hmm. Clavius is 146 miles in diameter, so it could fit the entire land area of Switzerland and Luxembourg in it. But the crater only goes three miles down at its greatest depth. So this is... Uh, problematic okay and then the fact that these crater basins all look like a contact lens right so what does that tell you it means that if whenever something is impacting with the moon an astro asteroid or whatever the ejecta is exposing a hard interior shell which has been covered by the regolith as if the regolith the, the moon dust and rock is astroturf right. There's one more very significant piece of evidence here, and that's um, 
that's these mass cons. There are places, mass con, mass concentration, presumed mass concentration. There are places on the moon where the gravity changes suddenly. Wow. Okay. And it's a problem for navigation, apparently. So when they're, when they're flying close to the moon, they have to account for these mass cons because otherwise they would lose a spacecraft. It might suddenly plummet to the surface of the moon. And what they think, is, they have these bizarre theories. First of all, there's no real evidence that there are volcanoes on the moon. But they've come up with some bizarre theory that like there's volcanic activity on the moon. And they're, because of the metallic uh, elemental composition of the magma that's dried, like somehow this metallic composition is causing a shift in gravity and some bullshit. Okay. Uh, and so they call it a mass concentration, like, like lumpy cookie dough or something like in the moon. And it's caused by volcanic activity for which there's no evidence other than something else, which can also be explained by the moon being a UFO base, namely uh, sighting about 500 sightings of lights dancing on the surface of the moon going back 300 years since the earliest astronomical observations of the moon. So going back to the 1700s, Astronomers looking at the moon right. have always seen lights moving around on the surface of the moon. And these, you know, dismissive so-called skeptics want to say that's evidence for volcanic activity on the moon, except that these lights fly in formation. And sometimes they fly specifically from one crater to another, and then they take off into space. So that's an interesting volcano. Yeah, very interesting. Very normal volcano. So anyway, to go back to the mass cons, uh, what I suggest this really is, is that there are either facilities under the surface of the moon that are emulating Earth-like gravity, and they're causing the gravitational distortion, or there are some, and uh, the reason I, I venture this other hypothesis is that these mass cons all turn out to be circular. They're all circular. Mm -hmm. So another possibility is if it's a space station, there may be giant saucers embedded into the surface of the station as an evacuation protocol so that if they ever need to leave this thing precipitously, they can just basically these saucers will peel off. Huge yeah. saucers, which are they've got zero point energy drives running in them. And so they're causing a gravitational distortion when anything passes over them. That's another hypothesis. Now, how does that dovetail into the fact that the moon is always facing the Earth, and which they, you know, they, quote, unquote, explain away by saying, well, the mass is lopsided. So therefore, you know, it's gravitational attraction. You think those saucers are deliberately controlling the moon? The moon is always facing that. the Earth. What is it? It's the same face always yeah. faces. Yeah. Always. Yes. And always. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, so Gravitationally couple... locked, they say. Oh, First of all, yeah, they've, a lot of scientists have commented on how unusual that is. And. I don't think it's the saucers doing that. I think that there's machinery inside the moon doing it because sure. this thing is, I mean, look, it has an incredibly stable orbit. And moreover, it acts as a stabilizer for the earth. The earth, we would have eight hour days without the moon. The earth would be spinning so fast that we would have eight hour days without the moon. Mm. The misalignment of the, uh, the celestial horizon from the ecliptic right, this 23 degree misalignment of the equator of the Earth, if you extend it out into space, and then the, our orbital plane with the sun, that's caused by the gravitational effect of the moon on the Earth. And so the reason we have seasons is because of the moon. If we didn't have the moon, one side of our planet, you know, would always be like, you know, unseasonably hot, and like it, it, the condition, let's just say the conditions for the evolution of humanoid life would be much more adverse between the fact that we wouldn't have seasons and you'd have temperature extremes geographically on the planet and the fact that the planet would be spinning a lot faster. And so it seems like this uh, is a terraforming device. And I would suggest that the, the fact that it always has one face presented toward the Earth is... A, f a function that's being generated by the same machinery uh, that is responsible for this station acting as a terraforming device. Mm -hmm. The other benefit to having one side always face away from the earth is that they can build a goddamn city there, which is what they've done. 
So um, Carl Wolf was a repairman who had a top secret clearance with the National Security Agency. He was an Air Force officer, but the NSA cleared him to come into an NSA facility in 1965. This is all in the disclosure project testimony that was amassed by Dr. Greer back in the days before he started to develop certain other ideas. <laughs> anyway, uh, back in the days when he was a pure researcher, let's say, um, among the testimony amassed by Greer was this excellent account given by Sar then Sergeant Carl Wolf, uh, working for the Air Force, who was cleared to go into an NSA facility in 1965, a few years before Apollo. And he was there to repair a photograph uh, processing machine, an image processing machine that was printing out mosaics of the dark side of the moon. Okay, mm -hmm. Mosa mosaic photographs of the dark side of the moon. And what was coming off this machine in this classified facility, which, by the way, he said was full of scientists from all over the world. There were people of all kinds of nationalities there, and he couldn't figure out why the hell this would be the case. In 1965, in America, in an NSA facility, Japanese people, Indian people, you know, all kinds of people. And what is this mosaic showing? A city on the dark side of the moon that looks like, like megalithic architecture. He said it wasn't made of metal. It was made of some kind of artificial stone, stone that you could make giant buildings from out of. And he saw obelisks, he saw dome buildings, lots of polygonal buildings. Uh, and so, you know, it, this guy expected he was going to hear this on the evening news for years, and it never happened. And uh, we also have then the testimony of um, Ingo Swan, who I think Ingo Swan uh, mm -hmm. was tasked in 1975 by... Uh, well, you know, the thing is, he actually doesn't know who he was tasked by. He was working for SRI, who was contracted by the CIA, Stanford Research Institute, had a CIA contract to develop remote viewing, and he was working for them. But some other guy called Axelrod came and grabbed Swan from out of that unit and said that his mission took precedence and he had a higher clearance. And he took blindfolded him, put him on a helicopter, took him to some underground facility somewhere. And had him remote view the dark side of the moon. And I think that it's the photographs of the, of the type that Carl Wolf saw that now we're talking a decade later, right? They want a remote viewer to go look at what these photographs were showing. Wow. And Swan, does, and Swan doesn't know this, you know, he's blind to the target, the way that a remote viewer always is. So he starts describing this shit and he's describing standing at ground level in a city on the dark side of the moon and there's roads going in every which direction. And he sees saucers parked on the sides of craters. And the most disturbing thing that Swan reported was that these Nordic people who live there use slave labor. Mm. They have large groups of, believe it or not, naked slaves mining the craters. Now, how that's possible, it suggests that there's an atmosphere. There's a, some kind of dome or something over it. And these poor people live in like uh, ramshackle uh, housing that's like created by putting a mesh over a crater. And they're all sort of herded in there like cattle. And they're using the slave labor on the moon. So these are the people who in my uh, novella, Artemis on Veil, I depict as the Olympians, these sadistic, tyrannical overlords, mm -hmm. who despite the fact that slave labor is utterly unnecessary considering their level of technology. I mean, they could build yeah. like robots to robots. Craters for them, right? They, for some reason, they, uh, they like to, maybe it's penal servitude. I don't know. In any case. But the slaves are hybrids, right? They're not humans. Uh, well, these particular ent now in my novel, in your I novel, there it's a hybrid factory or whatever. You want in to my call. novel, I talk about a number of things. First of all, I talk about how the gray robots, these biomechanical grays, which have been seen with the Nordics by a number of abductees, how they're manufactured on the moon, and so inside the moon, there's like a gray production line. All right, the grays are being rolled off the assembly line in there. Mm -hmm. Little munchkins who work for these Nordics. 
Oompa Loompas. <laughs> yeah, or Oompa Loompas. And then you have also all kinds of bizarre hybridization experiments going on inside the moon that they're genetic laboratories and so forth that I you know, describe in there. Uh, but what Swan saw were human slaves mm. working in craters on the surface of the moon like chain gangs in the old days, you know, like the naked slave laborers in Rome. I guess the question is, Jason, why did we pretend to go to the moon in 69 or did we go well we can leave that off the table if you want that debate and that's a twofold and are, why are we trying to go to the moon with rocket call artemis ironically talking i mean the elite know this it's not like why are they playing this uh dog and pony show so here's what i think about that and i i briefly do touch on this in artemis unveiled when i talk about president kennedy um because okay let me just take us make a, a, a side detour and I'll come back to why did we go to the moon in Apollo? Okay. But side detour. Um, part of what I show in this novella is how, because of these convergent catastrophes, the security apparatus of the Anglo American world is shattered, right? What we call the deep state. And it's a five eyes deep state. It's not an American deep state. It's mm -hmm. a, it's the Anglo sphere basically, right? America, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they're all part of the same thing. And so I show how this Anglospheric deep state is shattered by these convergent catastrophes, including their loss in the Third World War, a second American civil war and so forth. Right. And so what winds up happening is there isn't, it's not that there's an official disclosure, but it's that these people who had security oaths to the CIA, the NSA, are suddenly de facto released from their security oaths. Because those agencies don't exist anymore. The federal government that ran those agencies has collapsed. Mm -hmm. And the United States doesn't control like Australia, New Zealand, and so forth the way that it used to, or have the kind of influence it had in Canada. China has instead. So all these people who worked in these institutions, generals, admirals, high-level intelligence officers, they're released from their security oaths in like, let's say, the Republic of Cascadia, where they now live, or, you know, the, uh, the neo-confederacy, or... Uh, the California Republic, that's a sovereign nation. And they come out and basically testify to things that they had kept secret for years, which include, you know, what really happened with the Kennedy assassination, 9-11, hmm. and some other things. Right. And these disclosures in and of themselves are catastrophic. So this is a second wave of catastrophe. The physical catastrophes, war, you know, uh, earth changes and so forth, bring about a social catastrophe which comes from these disclosures and further causes the unraveling of the social fabric worldwide, especially in the West though. And so one of the things that I touch on to go back to why did we go to the moon and Apollo is that I think the main reason, you know, JFK, I don't want to say he made a lot of enemies because he was standing up against the right people. But uh, the main reason why, despite the fact that he, he didn't have a lot of friends. The main reason why he was assassinated, in my view, is because he had a plan to go to the moon with the Soviet Union because he had been briefed that these bastards are up there and he was going to openly and publicly unite with the Soviet Union in a common struggle against these entities, potentially using our nuclear weapons, the way that we had allied with the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany. Right. And this is why he was killed, because the military was planning a private, mostly secret military lunar expedition, which would lead to the establishment of a American military base on the moon, where we would then point our nuclear missiles down at the Soviet Union. Oh, it was Project called Horizon. Yeah, Project Horizon. Yeah. And Kennedy put his foot down and said, absolutely not. No way. Not only are we not going to build a military base on the moon, aiming our missiles at the Soviets, we're going to go to the moon with the Soviet Union. And we're going to plant both the flags on the moon simultaneously. This is why I think they killed him and why they killed his brother, who would have continued that same mission. And so uh, why did we go to the moon as publicly as we did? Well, because, you know, the plan had been that we were going to ally with the communists in the common defense of humanity and the earth. Yeah, very Star Trek Generations kind of the movie. 
or first for yeah first thing was it first encounter or first contact yeah but uh and then since then we have not even tried to go to the moon and now the suddenly we want to go to the moon even though magically the rockets keep breaking the artemis keeps breaking down yeah i don't think we want to go to the moon i don't think we want to go to the moon i think what the deal is is this that and this is what i what i portray in my novella in artemis unveiled is that well, we haven't gone back to the moon because, I mean, first of all, the only reason we we completed Apollo was because Kennedy committed it, committed us to it publicly. Okay, mm -hmm. once he made those speeches, there was no turning back. So we had to go up there. We had to collect some rocks and there had to be a photo op and so on and so forth. Okay? But if you listen to these astronauts, look at their faces, the faces of the Apollo astronauts when they came back in their press conferences. They look like somebody beat the shit out of them. They look, I mean, they do not look like well people. And, the, you know, their, their family members, their ex-wives, a lot of them went through divorces and so forth, have testified that they were, they were wrecks. They became alcoholics. They were depressed. Wow. And most interestingly, they had no memory of what they actually did on the moon. Really? These people, when they're interviewed, what they recount to you sounds like a mission log, as if what they've been made to remember are the tasks that were specified for them. First we did this and then we went over there and we did that. But if you confront them and say, no, but what did it feel like when you were standing in such and such place and you looked over such and such, uh, they, they don't look well when you ask them questions like that. Almost as if someone's gone in and found some way, either through drugs or whatever, hypnosis or some combination thereof, to erase their memories of what they actually experienced on the moon. Uh, and, you know, then there's testimony from Russian intelligence that on the medical channel, which the astronauts used for basically, you know, private matters, communication with ground control on, on medical issues and so forth. On this medical channel, which some, ha I think, uh, ham radio operators also picked up on, and the Russians definitely were monitoring, uh, Armstrong and others basically said to ground control, what are we going to do with these ships? They're huge. They're huge. They're here and they're watching us. Oh, my God. And so it, they said they were warning us off. Their behavior was threatening or menacing in some way. Uh, so anyway, it's clear why did we didn't go back to the moon. <laughs> and, and by the way, why, why we had Apollo 17, 18, 19. These were all ready to go. The spacecraft were built. And all of a sudden, what? There's no budget for it. I mean, that's ridiculous. Some billions of dollars were already spent. Yeah. Were, the spacecraft were already built. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, okay. And then we haven't been back in all these decades. Okay. So you, so you believe we, we went to the moon and you don't, oh, yeah. you don't subscribe to Kubrick and the fake moon landing theory. Well, I'll tell you, there's one thing about that, that I do find compelling, which is that if you know, you're going to run into some really weird shit up there that you can't disclose to the public, it's advisable to have alternate footage prepared Yeah, yeah. so that you might create some hybrid of actual audio and stage footage so that you're not showing the saucers that are terrifying Armstrong and company to the American television watchers, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that makes some sense to me. Um, but no, I think we went to the moon uh, physically. And I don't think the United States wants to go back. I think that the United States has to go back because China and Russia have definite plans of, I was going to say colonizing the moon, but let's just say establishing a presence on the moon, okay? And see, this is what's really disturbing to me, because it's obvious that the Russians have a full intelligence dossier on what happened to us on the moon and what we found out. Right. And if the Russians are building a space station around the moon together with the Chinese, which they are, they plan... Their plan is they're going to build a space station that orbits the moon, and they're going to send their astronauts from the space station down to the surface and back up again. That's the way they plan to do it. And if that's the level of space cooperation between the Chinese and the Russians on the moon, clearly the Russians have handed that dossier over to the Chinese. Moreover, the Chinese, given their culture, given their values, are not going to be humiliated on the moon the way that we were. Okay, They are not going to go all the way up there just to, you know, uh, you know, be scared uh, and, and turn tail and come back to the earth, right? And waste billions of dollars of research and development. 
So what does this mean? This means the Chinese have gotten clearance to go to the moon, which means the Chinese are in cahoots with the people in the moon. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot can be extrapolated from this in terms of the shifting balance of power in the world and how basically the world order is going to be restructured toward collectivism, paternalism, traditionalism, and you know everything else that you can see as facets of the Confucian way of life uh, that sit very well with the most orthodox aspects of other quote-unquote great world religions like Hinduism or the Abrahamic faiths. Thank <laughs> you.